So I'm super, super non-formal. Um, I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, I really just kind of prefer to have conversations in general, really kind of drive from you guys, especially when it comes to like what I do and the role that I play in this community. The first thing that I love to specify is the fact that I'm not a nurse. Um, I'm non-clinical. Um, I have no clinical background really at all, other than the fact that for some reason I've been in the healthcare industry now for about 10 years. I'm still not really sure how that happened, but I'm non-clinical, okay? However, I am an expert in my field and the fact that I have certifications to teach what it is that I teach. Um, so I am the executive director for Western Wyoming Reproductive Health, which is the family planning clinic here in town. So most people know us as that, the family planning clinic. Um, we try to kind of change our names a little bit just due to the stigma, and that's where the Western Wyoming Reproductive Health came into play. But most of the time, we will still refer to ourselves as the family planning clinic, okay? Um, the next thing that I really like to make sure that I specify is that we are a Title 10 clinic. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term Title 10, but we are a grant funded program and Title 10 is a federal grant that's kind of under siege right now. If anybody's familiar with it, you're familiar with it because it is a hot button issue right now. Um, and everyone has a really good opinion on what they feel that that, you know, like where they fall into what we do. And so I also like to make sure that please feel free to ask me questions. I'll cover a little bit with it, but one of my favorite things to do is debunk the myths that are going around about Title X and what we do and what we stand for. Um, that said, Title X was enacted about 40 years ago. Our clinic has actually been around for 40 years too. We are the oldest clinic that does what we do in the state of Wyoming. Um, so it was enacted, the grant itself was enacted to try to make sure that reproductive health was available to anyone, regardless of your social economic status, regardless of your age, your race, <coughs> your um, gender identity or gender, however you want to specify that, okay? It was basically the first like movement, I guess you can say, to say that reproductive health was available and a right for everyone. Um, and that's why it's really important that we continue to try to do what we do regardless of what's happening in the legislation because it is a right for everyone. That said, the majority of Title X clinics are pretty basic in what we do. Um, we're kind of your entry level. It's making sure that you have the ability to go and be checked out um, in regards to your reproductive health, your annual exams, your screenings, have a broad range of contraceptives that are available to you on a sliding fee scale. Um, and so that's the other ticket to a Title X clinic is that we are required to operate on a sliding fee scale um, and our scale has to slide to zero. So if someone absolutely cannot afford it, they are in a position where they currently don't have any money, we still cannot refuse them these services because it is considered a basic human right and our scale will slide to zero. Um, anyway, so again, we're very, like, but we're pretty basic in exactly what we do. Um, we do, like the majority of what we do is really counseling. We talk to people about their reproductive health. We talk to people about their sexual health. Um, and making sure that they're making decisions that are appropriate for them when it comes to when they want children. Hence the name family planning. Our goal is to help you plan a family, meaning when you do or do not want to start it. Um, so that said, pink elephant in the room for me is always what? Abortion. Um, and so that's the one thing that, like I said, I always love to take the time to debunk because <laughs> Contrary to what the majority of people seem to think, abortion is not and never has been a family planning service, okay? They correlate because obviously if you have an unwanted pregnancy, it's meant to be an option that is discussed with you, but it is not a family planning service because it is not a method of contraception that is used to keep you from having a family. Does that make sense? <laughs> Um, and so that's why the two get muddied together a lot. There are clinics out there that will offer those services. The law, as far as the grant goes, just specifies that we have to talk to you about it. That's it. We have to talk to you about it. They would like us to have a referral for somebody, should that be the choice that they make, just like we have referrals for prenatal care, or we have referrals if somebody wants a contraceptive that we don't carry, or you know anything like that, or referrals for adoption. In the state of Wyoming, we're super unique. 
because we don't have an abortion option. Um, there is a place in Jackson that is kind of doing it, but for that sake, since it's not a valid referral for most people, um, we don't actually have to make a referral in the state of Wyoming. We have to counsel them, but we don't have to make a referral. So every state is very different as far as how they, how they stand um, in regards to kind of that like <coughs> debate that's going on on the national level. Okay, does anybody have any questions in regards to that alone that I can try to make sure I do that? Yeah. When you were saying Jackson does it, are they performing the abortions or are they performing most of these referrals? There is a physician up there um, that is now performing them, okay? Um, which is new because previously, honestly, we didn't have a single, I mean, like, and I say this very candidly and I'm gonna be very careful that I make sure that I give that disclosure too. I tend to sometimes over speak, um, however, most of our physicians in the state of Wyoming will not put their license on the line for that. We are just too conservative of a state that they don't want that um, associated with them. So most of the time people have to go to Colorado or Utah. So it's fairly new that Jackson is doing it, but there is a provider there that is doing it, okay? Um, and as far as Utah and Colorado go, they're very, very different in like their, how they do things. And like that's why I said, as far as that particular discussion it varies from state to state to state because like Utah you have to wait like 48 hours before you can actually do it and like Colorado you can get it done like more like now okay she have a question yeah I don't know if, I, if this is a myth or not but someone told me that the state of Wyoming has like um money that they give to underprivileged people to get the abortion but they give them money so there is that is actually a true statement okay. there is it is a it's not the state of Wyoming though, so I wanna be very careful. State and federal money is never used for the sake of an abortion, okay? And that's why the, mud, the water is so muddy right now. It's because there is that misconception that that money is being used. It is not taxpayer dollars that ever go to doing that, okay? There is a fund though, but it is a private fund. I, it came from somebody, I don't know the whole story on it as far as the actual backstory, but from what my understanding is, is it was the family of someone who didn't have the ability to have an abortion and something went wrong, okay? And so it's a kind of a private fund basically that this family has put together in this person's honor, I guess you could say, to try to make sure that these resources are available a little bit more readily if it's a choice, okay? But um, it, there's not a lot, so, and it's pretty specific in who it goes to. Is that funding specific just to the state of Wyoming? It is specific to the state of Wyoming. And what's actually kind of unique about it is the fact that there is a little like, like fine print with this funding that they'll only do it as long as we have a Planned Parenthood in the state of Wyoming. Um, which, unique thing about Planned Parenthood, because that's another thing that I'll always try to say, is I am a Title X clinic, yes, but I am not a Planned Parenthood. I do get that a lot. I have people come up to me and they know what I do and they're like, I stand with Planned Parenthood. That's great, but I'm not a Planned Parenthood, okay? Um, that's a corporation, um, and so yes, do they receive Title X funding? Yes, they do. Um, in some states, the state receives the Title X funding, and in some places, it's private clinics that receive the Title X funding, so we're a little bit different. But there is some fine print on that particular funding that says that we have to have a Planned Parenthood in the state. We technically had two, um, <coughs> technically had two, but neither one of them, surprisingly enough, were a part of the Title X network. In the state of Wyoming, we had two Title Ten, or I mean, two Planned Parenthoods that did not receive a dime of the federal Title Ten um, funding. One, I do believe, has closed its doors, and the other one is on the verge of. So there's kind of a, within like our world right now, a little bit of a discussion then of what's going to happen to this very specific Wyoming fund. Because if the Planned Parenthoods do truly go under in our state because they're not supported, you know, will we lose that ability? So, any other questions on that? Yeah. So I was under the assumption that abortions were illegal in Wyoming, is that not illegal? They're not necessarily illegal here. They're just super, super frowned upon. Um, so like I said, we don't really have an abortion option, but we don't actually have any laws to do with it. And that's actually kind of one of my other things that I love to almost talk about because I'm kind of the black sheep in my network. Um, and it's always one of those things like, oh, Wyoming's an unfriendly state to you know reproductive health. And Personally, I'm one of those people that's like, I don't really think Wyoming's an unfriendly state. I just don't think they give a shit. Um, so, like, we're not really, like, under attack, but they're just not really supporting us, okay? And so I think that that's kind of where that comes into play. Is it's super frowned upon, but it's not really, like, there's really no legislation around it, okay? Any other questions? No? Okay, cool. 
So, uh, like I said, that's my little abortion platform. I like to make sure that everybody understands on where we fall on that. We don't actually do any of it, okay? That's where we fall. Um, we do contraceptives, though. So we do a broad <laughs> range of contraceptives. Um, some of those we do have to refer out to as well. But again, all the contraceptives that we offer will go to zero, okay? So you're talking your birth control pills, your IUDs. We don't do Nexplanon because they're super expensive and I can't get them cheap enough. Um, but any of your pat, your, well, we know patches are expensive too, so we typically, most people don't use those though. The NuvaRing, Depo Shot, um, you know, any of those. So we also do education around that, okay? Um, that's one of the things that I do. I go into the youth home, I go into um, Southwest Counseling, I go into the middle school, I go into the high school. That's pretty much what I do all day, as I talk about contraceptives and condom use and STDs, okay? Um, so we try to make sure that we educate on that, and that is one of the biggest things we do. We have people who come to our clinic, that's all they want to talk about are their birth control options, and sometimes they leave and they still haven't picked one. And that's their choice, okay? Um, so a lot of what we do is just contraceptive counseling. When I talk about contraceptives too, we also do the emergency contraceptive. Another one of my little soap boxes, and something I really like to make sure that especially nursing students understand, um, and that the medical community in general understands, um, especially if you're not working in this, because obviously you understand it if you work in this. Um, but the morning after pill, or plan B, um, is an emergency contraceptive, and it's not an abortion pill. I just got done talking about abortion, we don't really have an option. We don't also have a pill option. You're also not gonna find a physician that's gonna most likely give you the pill option of an abortion. Plan B is not that. That is available to you through any drugstore. You can walk into Walmart and you can buy Plan B, okay? So not an abortion pill. I promise you, Walmart would not be allowing you to buy an abortion pill just over the counter, okay? What Plan B does is it delays ovulation. So it's one of those things where if you have an incident where Plan A fails, that's where I love to say it, where Plan A fails because it's not meant to be a, a contraceptive on its own. So Plan A fails. Condom breaks, you use nothing, you forgot to take your birth control or you jacked up your birth control, whatever. Plan A fails, you can take plan B within five days, okay? You wanna take it as close as you can to your incident, but you can take plan B within five days. The reason for five days is because what it's meant to do is delay ovulation. It makes it so that if you were to ovulate, it's going to delay it so that that time period of which sperm is still alive in your system, which is about five days, you potentially don't release an egg. That said, if you ovulate at the day that you had an unprotected event and you come in and you get a plan B, chances are you're pregnant. If you take plan B, you're still pregnant, okay? Like it will not harm it in any capacity. It does not do any damage if you are already pregnant. Does that make sense? So there's no efficacy rate on that stuff, but it is one of the services that we offer. We offer that at a low cost as well. They're about $50 if you go get them from like over the counter and typically people pay about 10 for them in our clinic. So it is also an option that somebody can do. Okay, everybody understand that? Cool. <laughs> um, and so anyway, so um, another thing that we do then is we'll do all of your screenings, your annual exams. So annual exams, obviously your pap smears, pelvic exams, breast exams, any of that. Pretty simple, right? Um, so we'll do those and we'll make referrals if necessary. We make lots of referrals for mammograms, we'll make referrals to OBGYNs, we'll make referrals if you have something more serious going on, you need ultrasounds, whatever, we'll make those referrals for you. So at least the person can get in on a low fee um, and you know, like start that whole process a little bit for cheap, if that makes sense. Um, and I also say that too, I always talk about this low, the low, the, or the sliding fee scale, and we do primarily have to focus on low income. That is a part of our grant, is that the primary source of our income, is, or the primary source of our focus is supposed to be low income individuals. However, it doesn't just have to be low income, in, low income individuals. Like, we can do anybody. Anybody can come in. Um, and that's another thing that I kind of failed to say too, is anybody can come in. So that means regardless of your age. It's another thing that actually kind of puts us under fire sometimes is because there are people who have a stance on whether or not teens um, should have access to these services, okay? Um, and I'm one of those people that will tell, like I have a seven-year-old daughter, um, and frankly, if they think that they're going to be engaged in that activity and they don't feel that they can talk to their parent, why should they not have access to these services, okay? Um, it's going through all of their heads. 
So at least having a safe place for them to talk about it, that's why we're there. We, have, we can take them regardless of their age, 11, 12, fine, we can take that. They can come in, they can receive services, they can get anything that they want from our clinic without parental consent, regardless of their age, okay? And we have to operate underneath confidentiality standards, which means mom can call and ask if she's there, and if that 11-year-old girl or boy did not give us permission to say that they were there, we will not say they were there, okay? Um, so it is completely confidential, all voluntary, non-coercive services. We will not force them to do anything either. So we do have a lot of kids that they just want to talk to somebody about it. Um, they might not actually even be doing anything. They just want to talk to somebody about it. Um, so it's just kind of a safe place for them. So again, regardless of their age, they can receive any of our services, any of our services. So STD testing on through the gamut of contraceptives. If they are that young, how do you build for them, or do you just say you're free? Most of the time, those are ones that they don't pay a dime. Really? Mm -hmm. If they do, like, and everybody's individual when they come in. We do, like, a little financial consultation with them. You know, if there's somebody who, you know, they're on birth control pills and they're 14 and they babysit every once in a while and they can donate $5 towards their pills, great. They donate five dollars towards their pill okay but if they're 11 years old they can't bill insurance obviously because if we bill insurance what happens yeah eobs okay um, that's actually a national fight right now too is whether or not people should be able to bill their insurance and still keep their confidentiality you know another one that that comes into play like i kind of joke about it because we always think of teens but you know woman having an affair on her husband she also does not want her husband to know that she's having std testing okay so there's a lot of different times that that comes into play. Um, so that is a national fight as well. But nonetheless, if they really can't make any type of donation, because we'll always ask for a donation, but then they won't pay anything. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Do you have like an age that you see the most of, like an age range that you kind of deal with the most? You know, like it's kind of hard to say like a true age range. Statistically in Wyoming, you have about, like we go into about seventh grade. Seventh grade is kind of my favorite because they look at you like, lady, why the hell are you talking to me about this? Um, and they just kind of look completely like stark white in the face and they're super embarrassed and they're still at what I like to call the blush factor. Um, they just turn completely right in the face if you say penis, you know? And so they don't really tend to do anything. By about ninth grade though, about 26% are engaging in sexual activity, and that's statistically in the state of Wyoming. Um, and Sweetwater County actually sticks pretty close to that, okay? Um, by the time you get to like 11th, 12th grade, you have closer to like 50, 54% that are engaging in any type of sexual activity. So right in that you know ballpark there, um, about ninth grade is when we start to see them. They start to be a little bit more open about about 10th, 11th, okay? Um, okay, so um, STD testing, that's what I know that you guys wanted um, need to kind of address too. Obviously, we do pregnancy testing. I didn't say that. So I mean, like, if question prevails, we do pregnancy testing. Um, we also will do the pregnancy test that's needed for. I'll get a lot of people to be like, why isn't you know? Can I just take an EPT? You absolutely can. Ours is, um, you know, a medical test. It is not a blood serum test though. Um, there's that misconception that for some reason, like a blood serum test is the only medical test, and that's not true. Um, we still have to have controls against our pregnancy tests. So they are still considered more accurate than like an EPT. Um, the main reason for getting them in a clinic like ours is because it's your confirmatory test. So if you do wanna then go to your doctor or you wanna go, what I like to say, across the hall um, to community nursing to get like um, potentially put on Medicaid, you're gonna need that confirmatory test. Not that community nursing can't do it, but for some people um, coming to our clinic too is where they get their options counseling. It is their kind of their freak out moment too. It's that one person that you can come, you can take your pregnancy test, you can work through all of your options and decide like what you're gonna do, okay? All right, so STD testing. We do STD testing. It's kinda, um, we do it um, across the hall does it, community nursing, so really in our building we do quite a bit of that. We do it underneath a lot, underneath the Wyoming voucher. Um, so it's called No YO. It's a voucher that's through the state that helps pay for STD testing. Um, they don't necessarily pay for you to get the test done. They pay for that test to be, for lack of a better term, cultured. Okay? They pay for the lab fees that go with um, that testing. So a lot of times underneath the No YO voucher, you can, also, you can get testing, but it's meant that you get it done low cost. Or in our clinics, around $12. Um, to get the testing done, and normally, depending on what it is, like HIV is a finger stick, um, chlamydia gonorrhea is, you know, just a urine specimen, um, and then if you like Hep B, 
hep C, that type of thing, it's more of a blood draw. Okay, and th that one's a little bit more expensive because we actually have to send that to a totally different lab. Um, anyway, so we do the STD testing, again, regardless of age, just anybody who comes in and will use that voucher, okay? I have little pocket cards and stuff too. Oh, I don't know why I'm pointing there. They're right here. I don't know if I have enough, but I know that it was kind of brought up that you guys are going to be doing. So these little cards are kind of cool because it gives you all the basics of the STDs, like how you test for them. Um, and it kind of goes through each one of the STDs and like what their signs and symptoms are. Um, from a nursing perspective, one of the things that I like to point out too, um, and even just in general when I talk about STDs, is that if you think about our like, most common STDs, chlamydia is like our most common in this area. Um, in other areas, it's gonorrhea is a little bit higher, but really in general, they're kind of the same, okay? We're pretty close in symptoms, I shouldn't say kind of the same. Pretty close in symptoms, okay? Um, they're pretty silent. Okay, chlamydia is actually known as the silent STD. Um, so actually around 75% of women don't even know that they have it, and like 50% of men don't even know they have it. So that's one of the reasons why we have issues with it is because people are not taking into account that just because they don't have symptoms doesn't mean that they don't have an STD. Um, and so from like a clinical standpoint, if I ever had like my way, it would be a part of a screening in general about whether or not any type of, you know, has there been any changes in your sexual activity? Have you had a new partner? Do you have any um, suspicion that your partner has a new partner? Um, you know, anything like that, you wanna make sure that you're being tested. Just because you're not having signs and symptoms doesn't mean that you're completely clear of an STD. And it's amazing to me how many people that like I end up talking to and then they're like, oh yeah, I've been tested 10 years ago, you know? Um, and so it's kind of one of those things that should be a part of your, your normal um, every year annual, I guess you could say, just because, okay? Um, and so a lot of times we will try to um, have somebody do it as a part of their annual. Like if they have any question at all, just do it. It's super simple. You pee in a cup. Um, and if you, have, if you do it alone with your pap smear, you just, you know, it's just a different swab. It's no big deal. We're already there, right? Um, Anyway, so this is one too. Uh, another thing too is that if a lot of the signs and symptoms that go with um, the most common STDs, such as chlamydia and gonorrhea, you're talking like burning with urination, okay? From a nursing standpoint too, it's one of those things that if somebody says that they have burning with urination, where's the first place we go? Urinary tract, Urinary tract infection, okay? And the other misconception is that if somebody goes in thinking that they have a urinary tract infection, and we're not thinking that an STD is potentially the cause, and we go to culture or you know whatever, have them do a urine test for a urinary tract infection, they don't actually test for STDs in the same culture, okay? And again, culture is not the right word, but it's the one I use because I'm non-clinical. Um, anyway, so they don't necessarily detect it at that point, and so that's another reason why it'll go for quite a while, um, and it can get way worse at that point, okay? All right, any questions on STDs? Um, so I do have these if you guys want them. And I do have some of the voucher things too if you guys want to see them at least. Um, they just give you kind of the website that you can go to um, for the voucher because it's pretty simple. You literally just go in and you put in some demographic information like your age and your gender and stuff just because they like to track that. Um, okay, and then let's see. Reproductive health and counseling, obviously <laughs> education, like I said, that's what like primarily what I do, not that that's not what my clinician does, that's what she does if people go into, but like the main part of my job is that I just kind of go around and I talk about sex. It's pretty much my job. Um, <laughs> never thought that that's what I'd be doing, but that's what I'm doing. Um, and so it's kind of fun because it gives you the opportunity to really make sure that it's kind of always out there. Um, and like I said, I go into, um, I partner with community nursing sometimes. I sometimes, you know, partner with other agencies. And a lot of times that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the conversation going. Um, especially when it comes to reproductive health in general, if we feel like we can talk about it more, we're going to have less issues when it comes to it. Um, people take reproductive health, I mean, especially STDs and things like that, it's very taboo. Um, for some reason, it, like I said, even grown adults, it gives you that like, you know, blush factor. Um, and it just makes people uncomfortable. They don't feel that they can talk about it. And heck, there's even medical staff that don't necessarily feel like they want to talk to somebody about it. Um, and yet, it's a super important part of life as much as, I mean, like, really, in most aspects, it's going to touch someone's life in some capacity um, at some point in their life, if not on a daily basis. 
Um, and so like it's a huge part and it actually will always correlate with a lot of other things. Um, from that like kind of medical stance, if someone is not taking care of themselves reproductively, it can lead to other like comorbidities eventually. Um, and it could just depend, like it actually could be coming from other issues too. I'm someone who I actually ended up myself with a whole bunch of reproductive problems, all because I wasn't completely talking about the signs and symptoms of them, but actually mine all stemmed from intestinal issues. Um, and I was having a ton of intestinal issues that over the time they weren't treating it correctly because I wasn't someone who was giving them all of the information because I didn't think it was relevant. Um, and I ended up having a bunch, it was kind of just like one system led to another system type of a thing. Um, and so I had a little bit of a like breakdown mishap thing that I had to deal with. So I mean, like I said, a lot of times if we just completely forget about that side of things, there could be information in that could, that could be leading to something else too. Um, let's see, what else do I got on here? Um, but reducing the risk too, I said when I'm um, trained in a particular like curriculum, so the state actually has a, it's an evidence-based curriculum called reducing the risk. There's actually two parts of this. There's an eight week course and then there's a 16 week course um, and it is evidence based and our state has approved it to use it. So we do it in Sweetwater 1. Um, we're hoping to someday be in Sweetwater 2 but they use it kind of sparingly. Um, so the information is out there and that's actually probably one of my favorite things. Um, in general, if anybody's going to be working in this type of a like clinic atmosphere, if this is something you're interested in doing, if you want to be a school nurse, anything like that. I think the cool, I, the cool thing is that when it comes to reproductive health in general and as a community, that if we all have like kind of the same message going on, if we're all kind of saying the same things, um, then it tends to be, you know, like I think a lot about the idea of us doing this and then we do like life are you ready. I don't know if you guys are familiar with life are you ready. But the whole idea is, is that when you keep getting the same players involved and everyone is saying the same message, that it's going to eventually hit the people that it needs to hit in a way that it's finally going to stick. Um, you know, they say with almost anything else, it takes it's like 29 days to make something a habit, and that goes for pretty much anything else. It takes at least 10 to 14 times of hearing something a lot of times to really like get it to come across. Um, and so this is one of those things in my mind, as far as like really understanding the importance of your reproductive health, really understanding the importance of going and getting your screenings and the importance of getting your annual exams, the importance of being willing to talk about what's going on with your sexual and reproductive health um, with your provider and then having providers in general who are willing to listen to it. Um, because it is one of those that unless you're having something major happen, happening, like cysts and things like that, that they tend to just kind of put on the back burner because it's considered less important. Um, so I just, like I said, from my standpoint, non-clinical standpoint, be willing to speak up about it, but then also be willing to encourage other people to speak up about it as well. Um, I think that that's primarily like all I have like written down here as far as kind of making sure that I go over for you guys. Do you guys have any questions in general for me that you want me to go over? Of course I do. <laughs> yeah. um, so you said that you guys do like TAPS and stuff like that. Do you mm -hmm. have staff like um, doctors and nurses? That yes. Of in your guys' like facility? Yeah, we have a nurse practitioner. We have a full-time nurse practitioner. Um, and then depending on our grant funding and things like that, sometimes that you know, like that can change or fluctuate or whatever. But for the most part, we have a full-time nurse practitioner um, who performs all of all of that. We also have um, an OBGYN overhead. Cool. Yeah. So family planning covers the entire state. And it's divided up into <coughs> regions, is that correct? Yeah, so like as far as family planning in general, like the Title X grant, it covers the whole nation. Um, and then each state is a little bit different. In our state, it is governed by the, like, the funding itself. It is applied for on um, the national level by an independent nonprofit. Um, it's called the Wyoming Health Council. And then the Wyoming Health Council's got, there's 11 sub-recipients in our state. Uh, I happen to be a subrecipient. Some of the subrecipients in the state of Wyoming are within the Department of Health, so they're right in along with their public health. Some are kind of like in conjunction with the Department of Health, but like they're together but separate. Um, and then some are like me, um, that's com that we're completely just our own separate entities. There's about four of us in the state that are our own separate entities. South Dakota is one that the entire grant is um, managed by the Department of Health. So almost all of the um, Title X in South Dakota is done through their, like, through their public health clinics, okay? Uh, and then you have like Utah, you know, they're actually, their grant funding is actually governed by um, Planned Parenthood Federation. 
Um, so like it's different in every state, if that makes sense, but we're there. Um, one of the reasons why things got really muddy too, if I can, as far as Planned Parenthood goes, and that's because like, so as a Title X clinic, I have the, the things that I have to do as a part of my grant. My grant specifies that I have to offer certain services. I have to offer basic reproductive services, and then I have to have robust referrals for other things that deal with reproductive health that I can't do. Okay, that's what my grant states. And I have to do this on a sliding fee scale to anyone regardless of what they look like, you know, who they are, how much money they make, okay? But that said, if in my area the demand is not big enough and I can't hardly keep my doors open with that, I have every right to do whatever else I want. I'm, in, I'm a clinic, I'm an independent clinic. So I could decide to check ears, noses, and throats. I could decide to do sports physicals. I could decide to do whatever I want. Does that make sense? I have to keep them separate. And people who come through the door, I have to specify them as a Title X patient, or I have to specify them as just a normal patient that's on a fee-for-service um, scale. Does that make sense? Um, and that's where the, the waters got kind of muddy when it came to Planned Parenthood. They're very large clinics. Um, and they have a lot of money, okay? The difference between them and me in the long run is millions and millions of dollars, okay? Um, I don't have that, they do. However, that's why their clinics um, offer other services such as abortions, et cetera, is because they have the right to do that. It doesn't mean that they're Title 10, but they have the right to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. So from your perspective, um, upcoming nurses, um, how can they, um, the students, becoming new nurses, um, make the greatest impact, I guess, on um, your clients or the people that you see? On our clients? You know, the hard thing is, is so like right now, again, so Title X is really under siege. Um, and in the long run, as of right now, my grant is up, March 31st of 2018. Um, and unless they come up with some type of a budget sometime soon, um, we're, we have to close our doors in March because our grant is up. Um, that said, they're constantly trying to evolve like what comes into play. Um, so that said, we also are required to do all of this other screening, okay? We have to constantly be like looking at every person who comes in the door. Are they potentially in an abusive relationship? Is there some type of even marital coercion that's happening? Um, human trafficking, drug use, depression, you know, all of that stuff. And so I think me personally, again, I'm not clinical, so this is probably pretty easy for me to say, but one of my things that I think that the greatest impact in the medical community that we hope that someday we'll come across is just that idea of constantly screening. Um, from an administrative standpoint, we talk about the fact that, okay, so another hat that I wear is I do a lot of suicide prevention, okay? And one of the things as far as statistically when it comes to suicide prevention is 96% of people who have a completion in suicide saw their physician within the week of their suicide, okay? Now, that said, the reason why we have issues with that is because the average time between when someone sits down, talks to their nurse, and the physician comes in, between that physician interrupting the first time is six seconds, okay? So that said, if someone is coming in and they're saying, hey, I'm having trouble sleeping, it's kind of that idea of constantly screening and trying to really think of why is that person having trouble screening or sleeping. Like it's not just hey, interrupt them in six seconds, give them a, you know a prescription for sleeping medication, and send them on their way. Like are they having problems with something else? Are they coming in for an annual exam because they just need to be coming in for an annual exam, or are they coming in for an annual exam because they're having some type of like potential sexual domestic violence in their home? Does that make sense? So like from my standpoint, I think the greatest impact comes in just listening and really trying to make sure that we're and again, it's hard because again, I'm not clinical. And so in a lot of clinic situations, obviously you have time, like I get it, I worked in that. You have billing that you have to do. You can't just sit there and talk to them forever. But I think it's just always making sure that you keep that side of you. That's what's great about nurses. You're the ones that are gonna catch that. I'm sorry, but those docs aren't gonna catch that. So when you're talking to that person, it's really making sure that you're laying that groundwork for that doc to really understand what are they there for? Are they really just there for their pap smear or is there something else potentially going on? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah? I, I might struggle through this. So no worries. Hold on to the right here. So as an upcoming nurse, how, how do you suggest or what topics are the teenagers coming to you about? 
how do we start that conversation? Oh boy, you know, <laughs> I have some really interesting things, but I think this too, I always kind of joke that, yes, I get some interesting things from teens, but I get some interesting things from grown women. Um, so, and I think that that's another reason why I think it's important to have those conversations with teenagers. Ultimately, ultimately my approach with teens, um, and with my seven-year-old even, is just try to understand like where they're at with things. Just like take that approach of just listening to them first. You know, where are they at with things? Is it an exploratory thing? Is it that they've already started experimenting and they have confusion? Um, and then trying to make sure that, you know, obviously from a nurse, you're hopefully not in freak out mode. Um, but like, it's just making sure that you're really kind of like truly like listening to them and then not just necessarily taking that approach of, well, you are far too young for that, okay? Um, because the gist of it is too, is genetically we are made to want, yeah, we are, we are made to want to engage in sexual activity. We are made, we are genetically made to want the touch of another person, okay? However, if you have a lot of confusion in regards to that, you don't even know what you're supposed to be doing, then that's where you screw up, okay? Um, you know, one of the things too is that once the first common thing that people even think that they're doing if they don't have someone to talk to, they use a condom. What's the efficacy rate on a condom? 78%, okay? Um, and we like to tell teens that that's not just because of teens, okay? That's grown adults too. Um, so it's one of those things where they just feel like they need to talk to someone and sometimes it is just those basics of just knowing that it's okay to talk about it, get it out, figure out where they're at with it. That's my big thing. Um, because sometimes too, like I actually had a girl, like she came up to me completely crying and I always freak out when this kind of thing happens because I'm not a nurse. So it's like, please don't tell me something that I can't actually help you with. <laughs> um, so, I mean, like, and honestly, this girl was completely petrified, somehow thought that she had some type of an STD um, through just talking to her. Instead of just going in in regards to STDs and just talking to her, I ended up finding out She's never even had sex. I don't really know how she thought she got an STD. Um, and the poor girl just had razor rash, okay? She had razor rash. Um, but at the same time, like, she was petrified, okay? Like, literally petrified. So like I said, I guess that would be my stance. Again, I'm non-clinical, so you do what you have to do as far as, like, within your jobs. But sometimes it is just a matter of figuring out what level they're on. Where are they at? Yeah. I do have one more question. Yeah. So we're doing this in our discussions uh, and during class. Do you have much contact with the people that are coming in? Because my question is, what do you say to that 14 year old that doesn't want to tell their parents they're there? Okay, so I don't actually typically talk to the kids that come into the clinic, because by the time they get to the clinic, I leave that up to my practitioner, okay? I end up a lot of times when I'm out, um, you know, and I go out a lot with the nurse too, um, but they'll come up to me to talk just as much as they will the nurse. Um, and sometimes I think it is because I'm non-clinical. Um, but anyway, so typically though, if they don't want to tell their parent, that's totally fine. It's actually in the paperwork when they very first start that there's a little section in our paperwork when they go through it that if they are under the age of 19, it's actually how it reads. And it says that we are a clinic that has to operate underneath confidentiality standards. However, everyone in our clinic, we will try to get them to want to talk to their parents. Sometimes we're just that entryway. Sometimes we'll help them talk to their parents. If they wanna come in and talk to us first, they just don't know how to you know, approach it with their parents. If they just don't, you know, want, they just wanna to talk to someone first so they don't like sound like an idiot so that mom yells at them right away type of a thing, then that's fine too. Um, sometimes they'll come back with their parent and we'll help them talk about it. Sometimes they'll give us permission to talk to their parent for them. So I mean like every situation is very different, but we will always talk to them about parental involvement. If they choose not to at that point though, 100% their choice and they do not have to. They can come to us as often as they want for however often they want without telling mom or dad or parental guardian, state of Wyoming, you know, whatever. <laughs> Anybody else? So what are the like hours of the clinic and is it by appointment or is it walk-in? Both. Um, okay, so hours right now are, we are Mondays, Tuesdays and Thursdays from eight to five, Wednesdays from seven to four and Fridays from eight to noon, okay? We don't have a clinician there on Friday, so typically that's just like pill pickups and things like that that happens on the weekends. Um, those are kind of always subject to change, just depending on what the demand is as of right now that for the most part works out okay. Um, I have had situations, if you do, as nursing students, if you do end up out in a, like, a job or something and you feel like you want more, more access to low-income birth control pills and things like that um, that we can work with, 
um, somebody on, by all means, I give out my cell phone and I will personally go down. I did years of on call, so I guess I'm totally fine with running to the clinic, at, you know, noon on a Sunday for a plan B if I need to. Um, and then, yes, we do take appointments. It's always great to take an appointment because then you don't necessarily have to sit there, but a lot of times people will just walk in. Just kind of depends. So do you give the kids, like, doctor's notes to excuse them for school so their parents don't think yes. they just ditch school? Mm -hmm. Yes, we will. And we do work with the schools. Um, a lot of times that's the way that the kid gets there. We work with the school nurses so they know, um, and the school nurses will send them to us. Um, so that it's during their school day and that way they don't necessarily have to be worrying about when mom and dad would potentially see them before and after school. So do you have um, like other nurses or other physicians refer patients to you because you are a cheaper option? Yes. So like if we work in a different clinic, can we refer to you guys? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. What if a student is struggling for transportation to get to you guys? What, what are their options? You know, it really kind of depends. We. We don't really have any options underneath our grant to truly like help them with it. There has been things like with the schools where sometimes the school will actually help them with their transportation. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, like we'll, we try to make sure we're really close to one of the bus stops. So even if they can just get on a bus, um, like Star Bus has a stop that's like one block from us. So, um, you know, like there are some of those barriers, but for the most part, we try to do what we can depending on the situation. I'm trying to think if that'll word this correctly. Sure. Uh, I, as nurses and you know, as just people that deal with this subject with clients, I, I know that we bring our own biases and our own history into the equation here. Everyone does. Mm -hmm. So how how do you best control having your own bias uh, affect your relationship with clients? You know, like it's actually. I mean, that's a very valid point, especially in like what we do when we have to talk about like abortion or we have to talk about adoption or you know what I mean. Like obviously, everyone has their kind of their prejudice. Um, where that lies. Um, there's really, I mean, like personally, from a psych, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. I, I guess it's hard to truly, like, 100% make sure that that's not known. Me personally, I think it's a matter of developing a certain verbiage that sounds correct and have it be more of a pattern when you're going through that stuff. Does that make sense? If you have more of a script to go by, it's a little bit easier where then you're not just trying to do it like off the cuff where potentially um, your prejudices are coming into play. So I mean, like I think if you really feel that you need to do that, the other thing too, um, and this is one, you know, like my other hat that I like to wear, you could bow out too. I mean, like honestly, you can just say, you know what, I I think that you are better suited to talk to so and so, and you can decide to refer them to somebody else if it's going to be a matter of giving them a better um, like opinion or a better path for their for like their health. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Okay. Last question. So, just out of curiosity, as far as like reportable diseases, like HIV, you have to report what yeah. other diseases are reportable. HIV is really technically the only one. That's actually a debate that's going on in the state right now with um, family planning. So I'm going to be very careful like what I say on this. It's a kind of a debate that's going on with family planning right now and the state because, say, in the state of Wyoming, everything is reported into a database called PRISM. Um, and as of right now, they want every test, basically every positive test to be reported in there because you know, statistically they show links between other, you know, STDs and the prevalence of HIV. So they want to be able to report, you know, like find that. From the family planning standpoint, we are kind of in a bad place with this only because of our confidentiality stuff that we don't really want it in a database. Um, so we're not exactly winning this battle right now and we don't really know what will happen. It's not, ac it's not accessible to anybody else other than like the Department of Health and it really only becomes a thing if someone does become HIV positive. Does that make sense? However, there is a database for all positive um, STD testing. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Amanda. <laughs>